One of the questions I get asked more than any other is why is housing so expensive? And if you're creating affordable housing, then why does it cost so much to build it? We do look at this regularly. It's a concern for everyone who works in housing. If we could get the cost of housing down, then we could create more of it and have it be even more affordable, which meets all of our missions. So we do study this regularly. Every couple of years, the housing funding agencies come together and look at the cost of the affordable housing, the government subsidized um, housing that we've created and compare it to market rate housing or to other states. We've looked at this in a lot of different ways. The private market generally can meet the demand for housing for higher income households is what we find but it's really difficult, if not impossible, to deliver housing affordable to Vermonters with lower incomes without some kind of public subsidy. And so we looked at this somewhat recently and did another study of it, and I wanna go over some of the findings. And the findings summarize that while affordable housing developments costs in Vermont are in line with the costs that we see more broadly across New England, public resources for affordable housing remain limited and insufficient to meet the full extent of our residents' housing needs. At the same time, labor, material, um, and costs and time uh, are increasing development costs, and so they're on the rise. So the study that was done, we hired some national experts who had studied this matter in other states and actually nationally, and there was a study of 105 affordable housing developments just from Vermont that included over 3,400 apartments that had been developed over the previous 10 years. And the, refor the report found that using 2016 dollars, because inflation always comes into play here, but using 2016 dollars, the median cost to build or rehabilitate each apartment was just under $228,000. But it's important to inflate those figures to today's dollars and recognize that since the pandemic began, Costs for labor and materials have escalated far faster and sharper than ever before. And so that median is no longer what is typical in Vermont. This was done well before the pandemic, the study. And there were several key findings. One is that larger projects have significantly lower per unit costs, which one would expect with an economy of scale. The trick here is that there are many parts of the state where larger projects are not feasible, either because they lack the infrastructure, there isn't enough demand, or there's lower local density limits. And so uh, the need for small community-based housing developments limits our ability to contain costs by only funding large developments. Also, in our state, we fund both new construction and rehabilitation projects. And over the previous decade, new construction has been significantly more expensive than rehab projects. So it costs, the study found, on average, $77,000 more dollars per housing unit to build new rather than undertake a moderate rehab of an existing building. Also, another finding is that age-restricted properties in the state do tend to be lower cost. On average, the per unit development costs were $64,000 lower for age-restricted properties than for what we call general occupancy properties, where anyone can live there. That said, based on the state's demographics and housing needs, the state's housing policies promote housing that's available to all residents regardless of age. And so there's a limited amount of age-specific new construction housing taking place. Making use of historic tax credits does appear to be associated with higher development costs. So if you're taking a historic property, probably in a downtown, and you need to maintain a lot of those unique features that highlight the historic nature of the building, it will cost more. 
But the study found that the historic tax credit program that's available to those specific structures pretty much is commensurate with the higher per unit costs that have been identified. So it looks like the historic tax credits actually pay for themselves through the federal subsidy that's available to them. Another way that cost of housing can be impacted is when there's energy efficiency or green building interventions that have been made to the property. Now we didn't, in as a part of this study, we couldn't look at the life cycle costs of a building and to see how upfront investments in uh, energy efficient uh, features and um, heating systems and the like paid off over time because of the lower operating costs. That was beyond the scope of this study. But we do believe that those interventions do create savings in the long term um, that could offset some or all of those upfront costs. Another thing that drives housing costs is permanently affordable housing with deeper income targeting and support of services tend to be more expensive than plain vanilla general occupancy housing. The development sometimes can include um, community common spaces, um, offices for social service partners to uh, meet with residents. Um, and so the additional space or certain facility features is often essential for providing those services, um, but it does impact the per unit costs we see. And finally, projects with more financing sources tend to have slightly higher per unit development costs. So in some cases, um, that is just an indication of a more complex and costly project and that it needs more funding sources rather than the number of funding sources driving up the cost. But there is marginal direct and indirect costs associated with each additional funding source. So as a part of this analysis, we looked at trends in affordable housing development costs in Vermont and compared with market rate trends, and we found several high-level findings I'll review. One is that labor material costs are high and are increasing. And again, this study was done before the pandemic, so this has a big impact on the cost of housing in Vermont. Additionally, our affordable rental housing developments in this state lack an economy of scale. Developments with larger unit counts are usually more cost effective, but we're limited in how big we can go because of what the need is in our rural communities as well as what communities will accept. Locally required fees and conditions do add cost. Local jurisdictions that put um, restrictions and fees and conditions on development do have the impact of rising costs. Also, developments have to go to multiple and often uncoordinated um, uh, approvals and there's difficulty in obtaining local land use approvals and there's a lot of community engagement needed that adds time and is a benefit to the state but is not necessarily thinking of cost as the only policy outcome of that, but instead on making sure that we're thoughtful in the growth of our state. Act 250 approvals can exacerbate other approval related challenges. During focus groups and interviews, there was disagreement about whether Act 250 directly added to costs, but it was clear that the Act 250 approval process gave oppon opponents another leverage point with which they could stall or stop development. Additionally, infrastructure requirements can add costs, but that's often necessary in rural areas that lack that kind of infrastructure of water, wastewater, and sidewalks and the rest. And there are sometimes substantial amounts of resources that can be tied up in project reserves. And so that may be something we can look at doing differently. Finally, our policy priorities in our state result in funding projects with higher cost profiles, meaning that we are looking to serve the lowest income residents who have the highest needs and the like, and that that can cost more in our state. So there were um, recommendations made to the state housing funders 
to look at how to control costs. And in the end, the consultants found that there was not one single factor that dictated the cost profile of our developments. Many of the elements leading to increased costs in the state, um, especially when you think about labor and materials, are outside of the control of affordable housing developers or funders. But there were 16 core recommended actions that were included as a part of the report, which indicate that while no one strategy can should be pursued um, to correct all these cost increases. Instead, the report provides a series of steps the state agencies and other partners can look at to incrementally improve the cost effectiveness in affordable housing across the state. So it will take many years and of progress toward achieving these recommendations so that we can achieve this goal to try to make affordable housing even more affordable by making sure that every invested dollar is producing the value that we want to invest in our communities.